Thank you very much. Millions of Americans believe in ghosts <laughs> and in UFOs. Yet there is very little evidence that the souls of some dead people are hanging out in some haunted houses or that beings from some other planets, from other parts of the galaxy, actually are visiting somewhere here on Earth, especially usually in the Southwest. <laughs> <laughs> Similarly, many people, millions I would say, look at the horoscopes and look at astrology. Uh, yet, as far as we know, there is very little evidence that the billions of years old orbit of Venus, for example, has something to say whether you should fall in love or not. <laughs> Venus has been going around for a long time. Some people go to psychics because people claim that they can talk to the dead. But as Michael Shermer, a skeptic, says, that well, while there is evidence that people talk to the dead, the key thing is that there is very little evidence that the dead talk back. <laughs> now, on the opposite end, there is overwhelming evidence that humans and life here on Earth has evolved over four and a half billion years through the processes of natural selection and evolution. And yet, when we look at if the polls are to be believed, then over 40% of Americans do not accept biological evolution. In fact, like as this would say, this is from a Gallup poll from a couple of years ago, that 40% say that God created humans in the present form. And in fact, many of those people believe that the Earth is less than 10,000 years old, whereas there is overwhelming evidence that it is four and a half billion years old. So it looks like that perhaps in many instances, evidence doesn't have much to do with belief. Now, it perhaps uh, some or most of the blame can go into our education system, where which doesn't teach us into how to think critically or how does science work? How do theories get accepted? How do scientists form evidence and what they think is correct? That is absolutely true. But at the same time, for some people, even if that evidence was there from the previous things that I've mentioned, it seems that evidence may have no role. So I'm going to use an example to demonstrate that disconnection using the example of alien abductions. <laughs> now, many people claim that, well, uh, they've been abducted by aliens. Usually those abductions, uh, abduction claims think that the abductions happened in the early morning hours. And people experienced some sort of paralysis that they could not move, and there was a heaviness on their chest. And then they think that, well, some beings came in and they abducted them, took them to the spacecraft, and perhaps did some experiments that I cannot really talk about here. <laughs> uh, <laughs> now, these stories actually are, are, are remarkably consistent, and, um, and scientists believe that there is an explanation for that, and perhaps that is due to something called sleep paralysis, which is a momentary miscommunication between the brain and the rest of the body, where you wake up from the REM sleep but your body has not. It hasn't sent the signal that yes, you can now move your limbs. And so there is a slight this miscommunication that happens and uh, there are different studies of perhaps 20%, uh, 30% of the people actually experience it at least once in their life. I have experienced it myself. And actually it's a scary experience because sometimes this paralysis usually lasts about a few seconds or, or a few minutes, but in some rare cases, it can actually last an hour or more. And it is a terrifying experience. You are up, you cannot move, and it is usually associated with hallucinations also. Okay. Now, there are different 
cultures and societies that have seen that this is in the medieval times. It was associated with incubi or succubi. Uh, this is a famous painting by Fasuli, The Nightmare, where there is a demon, male demon, incubi, sitting up on top of a woman. Uh, but even today, you have these different cultures, and they all have variations of those themes. So for example, in, from Pakistan, where I grew up, over there, there is either shaitan, which is Satan or jinn, that actually takes possession of the body. And it is very similar type of things. Usually these things happen at the same time. But within the cultural context, for example, within the US, those same phenomena takes the form of the alien abductions. Popular culture provide the narrative around sleep paralysis. Now, as I've mentioned, well, there isn't much evidence that people are actually being taken overboard to these different spacecrafts. But the experience is real. The trauma is real. So while the abduction may not have happened, the effects of the trauma did happen. And in fact, studies have shown that some of these abductees actually display PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. They show signs of that. And many of the abductees say that this was the worst thing that ever happened to them in their life. Now, many of them also say that this was also the best thing that ever happened to them. And it is very important to understand why and in what context. This is a life-changing experience, this abduction experience. This is, this is something that is a very impactful thing. But it also provides a sense of uniqueness. Yes, it was a terrifying experience. But look, out of all of you, I was the one that got picked. I was the one that was picked for abduction. So it provides a sense of uniqueness. But it also provides an explanation for a terrifying ex episode. That, well, it wasn't simply an unexplained thing, but in fact, it was something that was uh, involved aliens, which also made me unique and provided an explanation. Now, while much of the public mocks these uh, claims, if somebody would, were to come in, in fact, uh, if I were to claim that I have been abducted by uh, aliens, probably I would not be invited to give this talk. <laughs> probably, actually, who knows? I mean, maybe, I, I don't know. I, I'm not presumed to say that. But many join support groups where they also find other abductees, other people who have also claimed to have been abducted by aliens, and they form a community. Now, here is where the tricky thing comes in. Here is this episode of alien abduction where you have an explanation of a terrifying experience. Okay? You have meaning because it provides uniqueness and it provides you with community. Now, a scientist, a skeptic, whoever you want to call it, would go and say, wait a minute, but don't you see abduction didn't happen? Why don't you look at the evidence? <coughs> the question is, when the person looks at it who has been abducted and all of the claim to have been abducted and you have all of these things going together, you say, but what evidence? I know it happened. It happened to me. I experienced it. You can show me that there is no, I mean, why, but why would I even seek evidence? Because it is in me. I experienced it. But if you also look at it from, purely from a rational model, you can see actually that that particular episode is not simply about evidence. It also provides a number of other things in terms of why somebody would believe. Now, the reason I brought alien abduction aspect into it about to get your attention, is that, well, I could not help but think 
about debates regarding evolution and why people reject <coughs> biological evolution. Now, I've been working on a survey along with uh, a team of scholars. Uh, we are looking at how Muslim physicians and medical students all around the world look at biological evolution. And we find that, well, many have no problem. They find, well, they are religious, they are, and they find, well, within the religious context, they have no problem with that. Evolution is totally fine. Some people say, well, science and religion are separate. That's also not a problem. So we see a wide range of responses. But of course, some reject it vociferously. <coughs> now, oftentimes, the reasons for rejection are religious but then justified in terms of the usual objections that people bring in. Well, there are no, where is the missing links? Or for example, well, I've never seen somebody turn from monkey to a man, okay? <laughs> now, we, we do get those. Uh, so there are multiple reasons for, <laughs> for, for rejections, okay? But, so for some people, evidence plays no role. In our service, in our interviews, we've been conducting these interviews, when people reject evolution towards the end of our survey, we do ask this question, do you think, can there ever be sufficient evidence for you to be convinced by biological evolution? And a subset of people, this is a subset of people who say they reject evolution, say, well, this has got nothing to do with evidence. I reject it because I think it is against my beliefs. Now, so this is an interesting thing, and that's why I had brought in the alien abduction part, because for them, you can give them all the evidence in the world, but they are saying, well, wait a minute, but what does that have to do with my rejection of evolution? Okay, now, from the com science communication perspective, this is a key thing, how we understand what do we need to address. And so here are these different reasons for rejection. So again, I don't think simply <laughs> providing more evidence is the key to go. Now, for some people, it would be. Some people are misinformed. Well, the monkey to man thing, for example, or the missing links, and there are other things that can work. <laughs> Lack of information. There are no missing links. Well, there has been, actually. There have been a lot of fossils that are out there, and so on and so forth. Okay. But where the use of evidence get a little bit tricky is when, for example, there is a threat to religion or, for example, to an identity. Just think about it. And again, by the way, I have worked with uh, the population that is Muslim, but that doesn't mean that this example actually applies to all other religions also. This is not very specific to Muslims. So I want to just clarify that. <laughs> Political correctness. I've been in America for 20 years. So, okay, so, <laughs> so the threat to religion, if you are asking, if the perception is, and we're talking about the perception, if the perception is that an acceptance to evolution would lead me to lose religion, okay, that's a huge threat because, and this is, I mean, in religious societies, societies are different, but in religious societies, it is not simply your matter of personal faith, but it is also a matter of being part of a community. If those two things are connected, that if I accept evolution, I would lose community and I would lose my faith, which is both related to, related to your meaning also, then it might be, you can, you can imagine that this is not a crazy thing that somebody would reject evolution, regardless of how much evidence you provide. So this is a very tricky situation because again, in the same way, we can imagine that for the alien abductee, you can imagine why that particular belief actually plays a role in that person's life and giving more evidence. I don't know whether that particular thing would be good or bad for that person. So this is the dilemma that comes in. Now, while I have made this controversial statement, whether like, you know, whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, let me say that I don't want to simply just 
just shrug our shoulders and say, oh, well, what can we do? Here are all these people who believe in that, because I do believe. And here's a quote from Carl Sagan. I got into science and astronomy because of Carl Sagan, so I make sure from contractual basis that I always put a quote from Carl Sagan. <laughs> it is far better to grasp the universe as it really is than to persist in delusion, however satisfying and reassuring. And I think that is absolutely true. But what to do when some of those evidence, uh, some of those uh, scientific claims that we are talking about, they are embroiled in meaning making for a personal level. And I think that is where things get very tricky. But what we can do is to appreciate I don't know if we will be able to convince everybody. And I don't, th I don't think that can be our, I mean, that should be our goal, but I don't think we can achieve that, simply because we cannot do something about that. However, what we can do is to make an effort where we actually try to understand and develop a deeper appreciation for why people reject these things. Now, if we attack the beliefs, that is not going to work. That may make us feel better, but it's not going to do a better science job of science communication. So one thing that we can do is to reduce the threat, reduce the cost of believing. Because what people are thinking is that, well, if I accept evolution, I lose my religion. So one thing you can do is to reduce this cost by saying, no, there are examples of people who accept evolution and are religious. Okay, there are really examples of that. So you have to actually portray that. There is another way of doing that, and that is to also show, which I do believe. I do believe that on a micro level, yes, a lack of evidence or, or, or an ignoring of evidence would work, but at a macro level, for a country, for a group of people, and oftentimes for individuals, it is really good to know what is real. It is beneficial. <laughs> Sometimes it's not, okay? But <laughs> overall, it is real, okay? And in that context, you can also say, like, for example, antibiotics. And that is deeply connected to our understanding of evolution. That it has a practical benefit. Over and over, we are seeing more and more examples of biological evolution into, for example, biomedicine. You can say, if you don't accept it, we won't have these kind of benefits. In some sense, we can raise the cost of not accepting scientific ideas. But we need to convey that somehow there has to be a balance. If the balance is going to be with meaning, you will always lose the battle. You will never be able to communicate. But I think the key aspect is be sensitive to how people believe. Thank you very much.